Thanks for joining us again this week, John, for our Ukraine weekly update. What news do you have for us this week? Hello, Finbar. Well, first of all, I would I think it's a good time to have a look at the overall position. You will read in the mainstream media and in particular in the British media that the Ukrainians are winning all over the front. This is totally untrue, as is most of what they've been telling us up till now. They are being hammered and it's getting worse and it's going to get much worse. Uh, reports are already coming in of an operational inc encirclement by Russian forces in Bakhmut. If this is so, the 10,000 Ukrainian troops about to be trapped in a cauldron there will have to begin an evacuation or be destroyed. That's the situation they're in there. And that's on the, on the Donetsk front. According to Ukrainian military intelligence, Russia is also about to launch a major offensive. They mentioned three areas, Zaporizhia in the south, Donetsk in the center and Luhansk to the north, probably around Liman there. In Donetsk, it will be Bakhmut because when Bakhmut goes, there is not much after that by way of defense. So things are taking off as we speak right now. Focusing in, John, on uh, the battle lines itself, I've seen over and back over the last few months, sometimes areas going quiet. I haven't seen the battlefront with so many forward movement, red arrows representing advances in the part of Russia at the same time. Is that is that uh, counterattack or is that plan for Russia and an advance, is it actually happening now or is this a softening up? Or... Well, uh Colonel Douglas McGregor has a good handle on this, and I'd be inclined to go along with him. He, his view is that what they're doing is they're testing the Ukrainian strength in different parts of the front. And any time they have a soft defense, they go at it. It's as simple as that. And if they do show success there, uh, they'll push there. It's a very eclectic kind of an approach, but it it doesn't necessarily involve huge sweeps across the country or up north of Kiev to block the Polish weapons. It doesn't necessarily include that, although it might. Mm. I think the present uh, line of, of defence is going to fall fairly soon, and then a whole new set of circumstances will present itself for Ukraine. And we spoke last week that this was, to a large degree, a war of attrition, as much as yeah. it's about territory or anything like that. And it seems that the Russians are pounding on. It is sad to think, uh, this week it was announced that the conscription laws in Ukraine have been changed so that 16-year-olds and up to 60-year-olds are now open for open uh, conscription. And that 16-year-olds are expected to register, not necessarily go straight to the front line, but are expected to register for preparation for conscription. And it's a wide range of people who quite often at this stage do not want to go to this front line. We've seen the videos of people that essentially being picked up off the street, out of their homes, from their workplaces, being... Uh, uh, fooled into responding to uh, telephone calls or, or orders of, of, as a one pizza guy that was picked up when he responded to a, an order for a pizza. And it's these people that are being sent against this Russian artillery. It's, it's, just, it's, it's just horrifying, isn't it? It is. I mean, if you think of someone who has never been under fire, uh, from ordinary uh, handheld weapons, never mind monster weapons that are being used there with ferocious noise, 24 hours a day. I mean, there is no sleep. If you don't get rotated, you have to stay awake or grab a bit here and there if you can. It's a horrendous situation.
and there was a video going around this week uh, available on Twitter and Telegram purporting to be a Ukrainian being interviewed, a Ukrainian senior uh, soldier, uh, and he cited the longevity of the lifespan of a new recruit, a uh, British registered recruit, to the front line at a miserly four hours. Now, that. we can't conf- confirm that in itself, but it's a, it's a shocking statement to hear. Oh, yes, it is. I mean, they're in trenches, you know, and uh, while they're excellent for defending stuff on the ground, when those big toss uh, weapons are used, they they cover a huge area with fire. Mm-hmm. And they've no chance in the trench. And they can't and fall back. Because, water. They can't fall back because there's a guard. They can't fall back because the, they have these Nazi Kraken soldiers who are standing at the rear shooting people who try to uh, flee the battlefront. Mm. It's an awful situation. In terms of Bakhmut City itself, we have a map here, John, there's been some developments, especially over the last 24 hours. Yeah, huge there, particularly to the uh, to the south, uh, where they're blocking, a, they're about to block a major road there. Uh, it looks like they have that under fire control, if not under physical control, but there's a smaller road that can be used, but can't be used for very, very heavy stuff. I mean, that's still available. I mean, the the thing to watch out for now is for Ukrainian troops leaving back mud. I hope to God they do, because if they don't, the the outlook is horrendous. Yeah, we have video footage which is purported to be uh, Ukrainian uh, military equipment uh, being shipped out of back I don't know if, if it's to protect it, uh, and to save it or what, but uh, been shipped out overnight or over the last 24 hours, I should say. Yeah, well, interestingly, a- along the front and in other areas, there have been instances over the past 24 hours where Ukrainian troops have left their positions and left their weapons and material behind them. And that's a new one. If it is the case, that the Ukrainians know the actual death rate, which is at over 250,000. If they know that, they know that they don't want to be there. That's the last place in the world they want to be. I've seen a lot of surrenders to the Russians as well, which would indicate that as well. And if it is the case that they've used up so many of their reserves that they're not able to rest any of the troops who are fighting all the time, they're in a particularly difficult situation. And that is something to be watched over the next hours. Yeah. Uh, last week we mentioned uh, the sending in of tanks and the talk about uh, m- military aircraft to be sent to be used by Ukraine. And uh, we've mentioned briefly who would man these things, you know, that it takes time to train people up and things like that. There is an Austrian colonel called Marcus Reisner, and he seems to be a bit of a big wig. A lot of people watch him and listen to him. And uh, he has historically, I think, connections with NATO. And Reisner makes clear that I think he's outlining the model that has been used thus far to be able to man uh, a lot of the machinery that's been sent to Ukraine and the model that will be used into the future. Uh, we'll discuss it in a minute, but let's, let's have a look, quick look at this video first. General, the Waffenlieferungen an die Ukraine, yeah, this is wonderful. But how schaut das aus mit dem Personal? Wer besetzt all diese Panzer? Yeah? Uh, kann die Ukraine da das Personal stellen oder wird es doch so sein, dass NATO-Soldaten dann das praktisch bedienen müssen? Man spricht davon, dass Polen schon 20.000 Soldaten in der Ukraine stationiert hat. Sie brauchen keine NATO-Soldaten in die Ukraine schicken. Ich ziehe meine Uniform aus, unterschreibe einen Vertrag und gehe in die Ukraine. Ich bin kein Angehöriger der österreichischen Streitkräfte mehr, sondern Vertragsbediensteter. Das ist die Lösung, die wir sehen. Was, nicht ausschließt, dass durch welche was man daraus schließen kann, ist, dass eine hohe Anzahl an ausländischen Söldnern sich in der Ukraine befinden, aber nicht von NATO-Soldaten. It's a, it's a bit of a, a slip, I think, because 
Uh, the Donbass people and the Russians have been saying for quite some time that there are fewer and fewer Ukrainian soldiers that they're coming across, but they're coming across a lot of Polish soldiers, huge amounts. They're talking in the thousands, in the tens of thousands. So given that we haven't been told the truth from the beginning about all of this, it wouldn't surprise me that these little uh, shady things are going on where NATO troops can turn up in Ukraine and fight for Ukraine. I found it hi- highly suspicious that <clears throat> all these videos for the last year have been coming out of Ukraine of American accented, Canadian accented, European mm. accent, British accents. And they're all young and they seem to be fanatical about the military. Why would they just retire from the military? It's not a case that they had already retired and then they decided to go. To my mind, they, there is a plan in place with the British military uh, Ministry of Defence and with the Americans in which they retire the soldiers to some programme. They might get some big bonus, who knows? And they're sent over to Ukraine and they're operating ultimately for NATO and for NATO's objectives. That's that's what I see in it. That, that sounds true. And I'd add something else to that, you know, in it. Throughout the armed forces of Europe, they are finding problems with far right soldiers mm. that they are growing in their number. Britain has a serious problem with far right soldiers. I mean, they were shooting at effigies of uh, what was his name, uh, the Labour leader. Oh, Corbyn. Corbyn, they were shooting at effigies of him over in Afghanistan. I mean, but the the that whole point actually about the um, the people going there isn't made strongly enough. A lot of these people are very very hardcore white nationalists, neo Nazis from all over the world. That's who's going there. They have at last found something to do that is useful for them, pursue their Nazi dream or their white nationalist dream. So that's, that particular aspect is kept very quiet, even though the, the uh, political powers that be in Ireland are very happy to talk about the threat of the far right. No such threat from Ukraine, it seems. And yet I recall historically a number of what were termed racist terrorist attacks that were carried out in the United States and in Europe over the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, When they looked into the background history of the attackers, they had been to Ukraine and they had been done training in in these these camps, these Nazi camps that have existed in Ukraine for at least 10 years now. Actual camps where from children... Uh, right up to adults are trained to be Nazis and brought up as cultural Nazis. Mm-hmm. It's worrying. Uh, John Zelensky was in the UK today, made a speech at the uh, at Whitehall, I think it was, uh, to all the British politicians and the glitterati, etc. And in that mm-hmm. speech, he made a kind of a half joke. Uh, we'll, we'll just have a look at it first and then we'll talk and ask you, do you think that was a joke or was there something far more serious behind it? We'll just bring that up now. Living a British Parliament two years ago, I thanked you for delicious English tea. <laughs> and I will be leaving the Parliament today, thanking all of you in advance for powerful English planes. Hilarious. What did he say? Uh, he's thanking them in advance for uh, wonderful English planes. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. This is after coming out of meetings uh, with, with the most senior people in the British government. Um, I, I think he knows something that we kind of know intuitively is going to happen, but uh, he might know something that we don't know. Well, see, the, the issue here at this stage becomes one of if Britain provides planes, will they provide pilots on our Austrian friend's formula? 
I think that's that's highly likely. I can't see them putting uh, these uh, machines that cost millions and millions and millions into the hands of of Ukrainian pilots that have no idea how to fly them. Or that, you know, listen, the reality is that it was announced yesterday by the Germans that these tanks that they're going to give them, this uh, small amount of tanks, is going to be Easter. It's going to be two or three months at least before they get the tanks, and they're still trying to source them. The Americans, who knows when those tanks are going to go in? Will the game be over? Do the Western powers, are they looking they're, for a get out clause? They're getting 78 um, leopards from Germany, Leopard 1 tanks from Germany. That's a lot of tanks. Right. But they don't, they don't know where they're going to source them yet. So, you know, to, the point they're making is talk is cheap. And they did announce yesterday that it's going to be Easter, if not after Easter, before they can get those tanks over there. Well, that, that'll be interesting to see how it progresses. You know, because up until now, the, the formula has been, you know, uh, basically Ukraine side of the operation tends to be very PR dominated and not, you know, factually based, like on the ground facts. And unfortunately, the on the ground facts have never been in their favor, but the bullshit has. Mm. And everybody has followed with that to this calamity that we're at right now. And they're continuing to follow it. That's the worrying thing. John, last week you mentioned uh, NATO expansionism as a primary cause for, just, just in terms of a conversation we were having, um, as yeah. a primary cause to this war. We do have a map that I just wanted to uh, share out up there just to show what we mean by that. A map of, of NATO and the Soviet Union slash Russia in 1990 and the map now uh, of NATO and Europe and Russia. Let's have a look at this. Here's that map up there, John. Uh, you can see the advanced over to the Russian border. And NATO Absolutely. seems to be determined to surround Russia. What's your, what's your thoughts on this map? Well, there's a bit more black to go in yet because Sweden and Norway will be added to that. So it's pushing even further than you see on that map. And there's a lot of pressure in Ireland at the moment as well to uh, join NATO. I saw an article today in which Switzerland is under severe pressure to abandon its neutrality and to form some kind of partnership with NATO when it comes to Ukraine as well. So it's all very worrying. Uh, John, your outlook for the week, we'll, we'll, we won't hold you to it next week, but your outlook for the week, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, for next week, I'd like if... if if listeners would like to have a look at Seymour Hirsch, the legendary U.S. investigative journalist who has a major scoop out, he has discovered it was the Americans who blew up the Nord Stream 1 and 2 uh, with the help of the Norwegians who set off the bomb. Denmark and Sweden were also involved in this act of war. Behind the scenes, all these things are going on. Mm. This the is the we're being played. There must have been a lot of planning in that, that particular job. Oh, absolutely. There's a couple of years. I had a quick scan over. There's been a couple of years planning in this. And um, they, were, they were determined that Nord Stream was going to go. Do you think, John, is there a schedule? Is there a schedule, you know... We mentioned gaming things earlier, you know, that they'll sit down, they'll game things out. In other words, they look at all the different possibilities and they make choices uh, based on very practical and utilitarian decision making. Uh, do you think there is a, a schedule laid out of where we are going that we just don't know about? Yes, uh, there may very well be a schedule. Uh, for example, there is one school of thought that believes that the West only intervenes to give Ukraine we enough weapons to keep the war going, not enough to win, to weaken Russia. That's one view. Um, my view, I think, at this stage is that the Americans have got what they wanted 
They've got the Nord Stream contract. That was their number one thing, and they have it. They also have hundreds of billions in weapons contracts that they got from Europeans who they succeeded in frightening. This is what Europe is, this is what's happening to Europe now by our friend, the United States. And buying energy from them now at a much higher cost than we were buying. Oh, times the cost. You know, they wanted that contract. They got it. And they're ramping up the prices so they can screw Europeans. As as Victoria Newland says, F the EU. John, thanks for joining us again this week. You'll be with us next week. My pleasure, Finbar. Good luck. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.